Welcome back. I'd like to start the second uh, session uh, this morning with the second half of the VEGF story. In this case, uh, we have a presentation by Professor Napoleo Ferrara. Now, he's an Italian who moved from Italy to the US, completed his studies, and then spent a long time with Genetech looking at how to create therapies and angiogenic products. And he, earlier today, uh, John talked about this translational medicine. How do we take discoveries in the lab and actually make them available as products to help maintain and promote health? And I think this example with the anti-VEGF therapies is one of those success stories. It's not, as we had heard in the previous talk, effective everywhere, but especially in wet macular degeneration, it is a very effective therapy. And I would like to invite Professor Ferrer to tell us about his work with Genetech and now with UCSD. Well, uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. First of all, it was a great honor to be a recipient of, of Garden Award together with the, with the uh, Hal Dvorak as well as other people who all have done outstanding work. You know. uh, I guess after talking about Hal, save me some time. I was able to shave a few slides because I'm, uh, we, we, I don't need to do much you know, background. I think we all understand that tumor growth is, uh, has, has been, has been uh, hypothesized to be angiogenesis, angiogenesis dependent. This hypothesis actually dates back to the early 30s, the, the late 30s and the 40s, but certainly Judah Falkman played a major role, you know, actually in inspiring lots of people to work on this field, you know. It clearly uh, harnessing this therapeutic potential that Falkman uh, uh, envisioned, requiring you know, to do some, uh, it was a, it, easier said, you know, than that. One, at first, you know, to identify the key molecule which regulated angiogenesis. And actually, this slide is actually, the date back from the, the late 80s, early 90s, from my Clarkspoon review, already makes the point that there are already many molecules out there uh, perhaps even too many potential angiogenic factors, uh, and actually, but especially the member of the FGF you know, family, which at the time were thought to be extremely promising, potent inducer of angiogenic. But as this quote, you know, uh, uh, insightful points out, you know, the fact that this molecule induces angiogenesis by no means uh, guarantee that they are going to be important as endogenous regulator. For example, antibody to FGF, even the knockout, you know, they show any vascular phenotype. So clearly something was missing from this picture, and actually that's our, our work, and as well as house work, you know, uh, 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 played a role, actually. Now it's well established, it seems to be very clear that VEGF, even though it certainly is by no means, you know, the only important molecule in vascular biology, is a critical regulator of angiogenesis, actually, as things turn out, you know, the work by myself, you know, by Hal, and many other people actually converge on this molecule. And actually, the history with this molecule is a little bit, you know, complicated. You know, at times, it's even confusing. For example, you know, v why VPF, you know, became known as VEGF is, is something which sometimes people found to be a little bit, you know, confusing. And actually, much of this confusion, I, I believe, stems from the technology and the discovery process in, in, in those days, which obviously is very different from what people, things are done today. At the time when all genes are known, you have some extremely powerful technology, such that things can discover it very quickly. In those Today it was very different, much slower. You, to, you typically you start from a biological activity uh, uh, and assuming that it was a protein, you need to purify the protein by many steps, you know, many steps. And the, and the key goal was to have enough highly purified protein you know, to sequence. And the sequence was essentially really, really a, a measure, a, a rate limiting step because without that you cannot, you know, proceed, you know, to the critical next step which was cloning, which couldn't help all the uh, modern discoveries. In the story of our favorite molecule actually reflects, you know, largely all these, you know, challenges, actually, some of these challenges. In 1983, uh, Hall, you know, uh, published this elegant, you know, paper, he is so eloquently described, you know, where they identify this vascular permeability factor, this, this activity which uh, makes blood vessels leak, you know. And uh, this was a biological, it was an extremely remarkable study. But biochemically, this was not a definitive study because the VPF was not fully purified. But in a subsequent study, published actually seven years later in 1990, you know, Dr. Dvorak and his colleague were able to fully purify VPF and determine an N-terminal sequence. So this 
timeline certainly makes the point what the challenge was to purify protein in those days. But also makes the point that notwithstanding of this elegant early work, you know, for a number of years, the VPF was not in any database. Its identity was not known because there were no sequence data. And so this is what was known about the VPF at that time. And, and this may set you know, the stage to introduce our story, our work, which actually started from a completely different you know, biology angle. Actually, of all things, I was studying the pituitary gland. I, was a, I had a background in endocrinology. I, did my, I was a postdoc at UCSF. I ended up you know, working on some relatively obscure population uh, of cells in the pituitary, which are called follicular stellate cells, which, which are this, uh, portrayed as these elements in gray cells, which do not pro produce hormones, the cells with, with a dot, you know, with a representing of the secretory granules. And the cells have this kind of in intriguing organization, They're almost like an astrocyte-like organization that are in between the secretory cells, but very frequently actually ended up in very close proximity with you know, the perivascular space, the blood vessels. So even though this, this, the, the cells were very, very poorly understood, you know, there was always something intriguing about you know, their organization. It suggests you know, some sort of regulatory function, either in communication, maybe in organizing you know, the pituitary architecture, including the vasculature. And that's what I thought was extremely fascinating, actually. I was, uh, I was able to isolate, you know, apparently for the first time some follicular cells from bovine pituitary. And the cells actually had some interesting properties which, uh, which I'm not going to go over in, in the in interest of time. You know, They transport ions in, in culture. Actually, this stroke, what you see here is, is a so-called you know, dome which reflects you know, transport of... of uh, 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 but, but at the time, I, I thought I was much more fascinated by the possibility that the cells produce you know, growth factor. And I tested you know, the condition media of this uh, monolayer and, and lo and behold, you know, there was uh, this uh, very strong mitogenic effect on endothelial cells. At that time, the people didn't think very much of my supervisor, just could be just another factor, could be basic FGF. But perhaps, you know, someday some wishful thinking, or you hope that you've done, done something interesting. And so I pursued the story, actually. Uh, even when I was at UCSF, uh, we initially purif partially purified this molecule. But then when I joined Genentech in 1988, I was certainly fortunate, you know, to be in an environment with such, you know, incredible technology, even such great colleagues. And in a relatively short time, we were able to fully purify sequence, you know, this molecule, which uh, we call vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, you know, because it seems to have a very unique, you know, property. It was a mitogen selective for endothelial cells, unlike all these other factors, you know. And then based on the sequence, we clone, you know, the bovine and then human, human VEGF, actually. The reason we, we, we call it you know, VEGF, actually, we certainly didn't mean any disrespect you know, to House, to his pioneering work, but as I said, at that time, you know, VPF did not exist in any database, you know, and, and, and so certainly that, so we found a new activity, a new, a new sequence, and so we gave a new name. The connection with the VPF was actually discovered toward the end of 1989 because of work done by another group, you know, by a group of Monsanto was able to clone human VPF. It showed that it was a identical to, to one of the molecules that we, I, I will uh, describe in a moment. But, so at that time, this was a very intriguing molecule, actually some intriguing homology, for example, with the PDGF you know, family. But certainly, much more work was required to, to, to tell that this was just no more than just one of the pre, uh, another angiogenic factor. And there was already some characteristic you know, in, in, the, in this protein, which was really very intriguing. You know, the VEGF you know, gene undergo alternative splicing, and, 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 and there has a multiple isoform are generated. Actually, today there are as many as 10 different isoforms. But this was the original isoform, you know. And you can see there is an asterisk. This asterisk indicates a heparin binding domain. So there is one form that does not have any heparin binding, you know, the, uh, and others have two heparin binding domain. And actually, it is this heparin binding domain essentially targeting you know, the protein to the extracellular matrix to some proteoglycans. So the prediction was that this molecule very well suit, you know, to generate, you know, this uh, biochemical gradients, this tridimensional gradients, which seems to be so, so important for, for angiogenesis. And actually, VGF-165 seems to be the best, you know, suited because it's partially diffusible and partially bound to the matrix. And I must say that actually a decade, you know, later, work done by Peter Carmelitti and others doing isoform-specific knockouts, largely, uh, it was in large agreement with, with, with this prediction about, you know, this different, you know, uh, uh, 
by the video of this molecule. Another, another process which turned out to be very important is proteolysis. You know, uh, the, uh, protease like a plasma or MMP, which are particularly prominent in pathological conditions like in AMD, cleave the VEGF and, and remove the heparin binding domain. And this, this product seems to be very abundant in, in, in these pathological conditions. And now we, we know a lot you know, about you know, the receptor. Now we know that there is a three tyrosine uh, kinase you know, receptor which binds this family. Actually, they were each you know, they're a unique you know, class with the seven immunoglobuli-like domains. You know. And now we, the, the, the first receptor is VEGF receptor one. Actually, we uh, identify in collaboration with Rusty Williams you know, many years ago. And, uh, uh, the VEGF receptor 3 is that, you know, it binds to another set of ligands, you know, uh, uh, which regulate lymphangiogenesis. So, uh, as you can see, there is multiple ligands, you know, of which VEGF, VEGF, and now called VEGFA, is one of those, you know. But, but now it's very clear that of this, all this receptor, VEGF receptor 2, is the most important, is the one which mediates, you know, the, the key activity of VEGF. The role of this uh, the, uh, the VEGF receptor 1 is highly complex, you know, and, and uh, cell type, you know, dependent. Much of all studies that I could present to you to illustrate you know, the importance of EGF in, in vascular biology in development, I don't think I can do much better. They showed this early studies published in 1996 where we report you know, the knockout of EGF. This, this was a very... Uh, very unexpected you know, finding because inactivation of a single VEGF allele results in embryonic lethality. You can see there is a, the, the mutant is a, hardly has any blood vessels in the yolk sac, and embryo is probably already you not know, dead. Actually, at the time, you know, another group, you know, a Euro Canadian group, which included you know, Andres Nagy, reported you know, a very similar finding you know, in the same issue of nature. I think it was extremely reassuring because there was actually reason to be skeptical because this was at that time the first example of a, a Zygos lethality, at least in mammals. And uh, the, as I said, you know, now we know that you know, the receptor, the VEGF receptor 2, is the, really the key receptor. And actually, actually work done in Toronto, actually, by Janet Rossan and colleagues, you know, many years ago, demonstrating the critical role of VEGF receptor 2, actually, in, in, in angiogenesis. Actually, the, 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 the homozygous knockout mice have a phenotype which is similar to the VEGF you know, heterozygous. There is an absence of vasculogenesis, angiogenesis, you know, and, 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 and my, there is a, a lethality Eight at uh, 8.5 to 9.5. What we learned in more recent time, I think, is, is been actually some very illuminating, you know, biochemistry and, and, and genetics. There are two phosphotyrosine in VEGF receptor two, which seems to be critical to mediate, you know, the bio, some of the biological activity of VEGF. When phosphotyrosine in, in position 949 in the mouse and 951 in the human, you know, actually seems to be very important to mediate, you know, the VPF effect, you know, described by Hal, actually, uh, uh, and working on by, by, group, by different groups, like David Cherish, recently by Lena Kleisson Welsh, it showed this phosphotyrosine interact with an SH2 domain protein called TSAD, which activated you know, SARC, and then SARC, you know, from complex with the V cadirin, which ended up opening up in you know, this junction, you know, and mediated the permeabilizing effect of VEGF, which, as I remind you, is extremely rapid, much transient effect, you know. And mice which have inactivating mutation in this pathway, actually, are almost completely resistant, refractory to this permeabilizing effect, you know. And on the other hand, these mice don't have any other obvious phenotype. They, they develop, you know, normally, that is, and it's somewhat, you know, surprising, actually, even in a physiological parameter, for example, kidney permeability, do not seems to be affected you know, by this by this lack of this direct you know, permeabilizing effect. It may, it may appear surprising, but you know, perhaps it you will know, reflect the fact that this activity is very rapid but transient. There are certainly other mechanisms I'm going to allude to later on which can mediate you know, this, this chronic permeability. Instead, the tyrosine 1173 uh, has been reported stated to be important to, uh, to engage the MAP kinase in a pathway, the PA3 kinase in a pathway. And uh, uh, Dr. Shibuya, a number of years ago, showed that you know, the uh, substitution of tyrosine to phenylalanine virtually phenocopies the, 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 the VEGFR2 null phenotype. There is actually let er, early with the early embryonic lethality. So it would appear, based on this uh, genetic data, that you know, the, 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 the truly a essential function of EGF are immediating vasculogenesis and, and angiogenesis. These are really uh, 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 non-redundant functions. 
Um, of course, there has been a lots of interest, actually, in, 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 as, as we heard at the beginning, you know, in, in, in the kind of introduction in targeting VEGF. Is it going to be a therapeutic target? You know? and, and, and certainly, VEGF seems to have some features which seems to be uh, at least you know, promising. For example, we know that hypoxia is one of the key inducers of, of, of actually of a VEGF expression, actually, and, and as well as a number of cytokines and, and, and even uh, oncogen like RAS. Uh, 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 in activating of VEGF. It is in, in, uh, relates to VEGF, you know, releasing the microenvironment, which is potentially can activate, you know, uh, VEGF receptor 2 and uh, mediate angiogenesis. Actually, the first evidence that this has uh, happened, actually, uh, we, we showed that in, in, uh, in 1993. This was uh, literally the first in vivo experiment we did, you know, with the blocking of VEGF. The knockout, you know, came years later. And uh, at that time, it, it was widely believed that angiogenesis required many angiogenic factors. So it was really very surprising that blocking only this factor actually uh, could, could have such a profound inhibitory effect you know, on, on the growth of multiple tumor types. And actually, we were able to extend you know, this data to other models, and there was a, a robust effect. You know, and it was an interesting combination with the chemotherapy. And that, on that hand, this antibody are human specific, so you're limited you know, to testing only in, in human xenografting. So there was a, some limitation. You cannot you know, certainly account you know, the role of VEGF you know, in, 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 in murine model. So at the time, we thought it would be very important to develop a novel reagents which allow us to st study the biology. In fact, we, 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 uh, the VEGF receptor 1, we, we, it was already known to bind the VEGF with extremely high affinity. So potentially a soluble receptor could be a good antagonist. But unfortunately, the full length in a receptor, which is actually seven immunoglobulin like domain, is a very large in a molecule. And if, if C fusion protein is extremely unstable, it's enough life of uh, literally minutes. And so work done in, 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 by, uh, by an extremely talent, you know, postdoc, you know, Terry Davis might was able to d d demonstrate that all these seven IG-like domain, only one is really critical to bind, you know, VEGF, actually. If you introduce, you know, domain 2 of VEGF receptor 1 into VEGF receptor 3, that confers all of the ligand binding characteristic of VEGF receptor 1. And so we thought to, to, to utilize the structural information to make an, an antagonist, you know, a, a smaller, a, a soluble receptor, which include domain 2 and the flanking domain fuse it to an IgG. Actually, this is to not be an extremely useful reagent that we use actually to probe you know, the biology of VEGF alongside with some genetic tools that we develop, like you know, VEGF lox P mice, as well as receptor lox P mice. It is actually one experiment I want to show you because once again, given my background in endocrinology, I was extremely pleased you know, to, to, to show that the VEGF was this long sought you know, corpus luteum angiogenic factor. In ovary, uh, uh, development of the corpus luteum you know, is accompanied by a dramatic increase you know, in, in, in angiogenesis, which then enable differentiation and, and actually in the pro pro production of progesterone. And this is a rat model of hormonal induced ovulation, actually. After uh, administering mean, these hormones, there is this dramatic growth of the ovary. And this is the effect of some control protein. Now, with this FL soluble FLT123 IgG, there was this essentially 100% inhibition of angiogenesis and growth. And this find that subsequently we're extending it to other species, including you know, primates. You know. And, and, and we're able to show also the critical role of VEGF you know, in, in skeletal growth in a variety of other physiological and pathological processes. In, in terms of a tumor biology, using this reagent, we're able to demonstrate you know, something which was really, I believe it was important, the contribution of the stroma in producing VEGF. You know. This is a, 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 the growth of human lung you know, carcinoma cell line is called calusixin, actually. It's a very modestly inhibitor by the anti-VEGF, the anti-human VEGF antibody, there is almost no effect. You know. And instead, the soluble F FLT123 uh, is a very profound inhibitory effect. And then we discover, actually, most of the VEGF you know, comes from the stroma, not from the tumor. And, and, and I think this is really a very important finding, actually. We're able to show that some member of the PDGF family are so critical to attract you know, the stroma. And actually, our work on the soluble receptor in domain two, I, 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 be, I believe, inspired other people, actually. In, in 2002, a group of Regeneron actually uh, reported and published a paper describing the, uh, the, uh, what they call the VEGF you know, trap R1, R2, which is a soluble receptor fused to an IgG. And uh, this, uh, the key binding element is still domain 2 of VEGF receptor 1. Actually, the, there are 
template which they call parental VEGF FRAP is our FLT123 IgG. It added the number of mutations, the number of variants to reduce naturally the, the heparin binding because there is a basic domain which is limited by availability. And the molecule that they, they come up with is, is, is a longer of life, right? exactly the same, almost exactly the same binding characteristic and biological activity as a as a, a FLT123 IgG. At the time, however, Genentech, our company, was not particularly interested in this technology. They thought it was like some kind of, you know, uh, uh, proof of concept, but not really the real therapeutics, actually. To not to be a free perceptus because it's a successful therapeutic, especially in the eye. At the time, the, 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 the real drug that in our company was to develop was a humanized antibody. And, and, and that's what, uh, 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 this, uh, such an antibody now is called as Bevacizumab Boravastin. is the humanized variant of the murine antibody I showed you at the beginning. You know. And this antibody reflects you know, as all the characteristic of the murine antibody in terms of you know, specificity, in terms of, uh, 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 and like many monoclonal antibodies, a long of life, which of course is, is an advantage. And actually, this is the, the, the first experiment actually with, uh, which uh, proved testing of the hypothesis that actually blocking of VEGF is conferencing advantage in humans. This is a phase three study published actually in 2004 and actually uh, it showed that there is a survival benefit in, in patients with the metastatic colorectal cancer actually. How uh, said that you know, this data were disappointed. At that point, I thought it was uh, totally unexpected to me because the conventional wisdom was that, uh, as he said, you know, this kind of treatment works only in some early stage you know, disease. You know, and many people believe that the fate of this antibody was going to be like the MMP inhibitor, which is another class of drugs which actually block early stage of angiogenesis but fail completely. Instead, it was uh, very surprising that you know, this was at the time the longest you know, survival benefit you know, conferred by a biological agent, and 10 years later is still a standard of therapy. And what is a very important point, this benefit is seen naturally without any, any biomarker. This unfortunately is a, yet a limitation of this therapy. So the effect is sufficient to robust that you even in all treating all commerce, you show the survival benefit, you know. And Bevacizumab uh, has shown benefit including survival in lung, you know, cancer as well as in, uh, in the renal cell carcinoma, etc. This is one of the most you know, recent studies which I found to be intriguing, interesting, because you can have this uh, visualization of angiogenesis. This, uh, this is cervical cancer. You can see in a colposcopy this atypic, this abnormal vessels, actually, which uh, uh, which all mark of this disease, which is uh, largely preventive, you know, in, in, in the developing you know, world. But in, in many parts of the world, it is a measure of met medical need, you know. And, and, and NCI uh, sponsored consortium actually recently showed that adding bevacizumab to chemotherapy, actually, to, to different backbone of therapy result in a survival benefit in this patient. This is the first agent to show a survival benefit in this disease, which led you know, to approval you know, just a, a little over a month ago. But, and, and, and I don't want you know, to imply that bevacizumab is the only inhibitor of, of angiogenesis. There is many others. Actually, this slides illustrate you know, some of the therapeutic targets in, in the vessel wall, not only the VEGF you know, signaling pathway with the, with the bevacizumab, aflibercept, you know, now ramosirumab, an antibody which which block, you know, VEGF receptor 2, has shown survival in gastric cancer. And there is a, 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 several ticket, a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, like a sunitinib, sorafenib, and others, which actually have been especially effective in renal cell carcinoma. There is additional target, for example, the angiopoietin in type 2 system, actually, in a molecule called AMG386, developed by Amgen, it shows some promising data in ovarian cancer. And, and other targets, like integrin, unfortunately, and have, have, not been, have been less you know, successful as yet. You know. But clearly, in, in, uh, like, like with the most you know, cancer therapy, we have not really cured, uh, uh, we're not solving you know, the problem of cancer. There is a clearly you know, patients eventually progress, you know, and, uh, um, and, and, and certainly we know that the mechanism of resistance to VEGF inhibitor are very different from the mechanism of resistance, for example, to, to a rough kinase inhibitor, to EGFR, which are due to mutation. In this case, it looks that the micro environment plays, plays a very critical role, actually. What is very interesting that, you know, patients which are treated with Avastin and progress with Avastin, if they are treated again with Avastin, they show a survival benefit, which suggests you know, some, some element of plasticity and reversibility in this resistance. And this actually has been the hypothesis we've been working on for a, for a number of years.
years, actually. There is no time to go into any, any much of detail in that, much of work to summarize, you know, actually, work started in 2007 in our lab, actually. We, we, we identify a pathway which rem remains to be validated in humans, but at least in a number of animal models, uh, consisting in, uh, in homing of, you know, myeloid cells, CD11B, GR1 myeloid cells uh, in the tumor microenvironment, where they produce, you know, additional angiogenic fat. One is a, is a small protein called BV8, which is interactive with the two GPCRs. And this BV8 is exquisitely induced by GCSF, that is measuring you know, myeloid you know, stimulating fat, which, which can induce angiogenesis, which in this case can be like in, in part you know, independent on VEGF. And we discover actually that you know, GCSF actually is known to be produced by many tumor, actually, in addition to, to be such a, an physiological regulator. And the RAS pathways plays a very critical role, in fact. We, we found that you know, in activating you know, RAS, either to, to mutation, for example, in RAF, or activation by tyrosine kinase, the result actually increasing you know, transcription of GCSF mediated by the ETS2 transcription factor, which result in this upregulation of uh, this uh, eventual homing of myeloid cells. What is not indicated in this slide, we recently show even the adaptive immune system can play an important role. For example, TH17 cells and, and IL-17 can also mediate you know, this uh, a, a, a VEGF in, independent angiogenesis. Much as has been pointed out you know, in the, uh, the, the, this morning, actually, perhaps the most Im, uh, important, at least the most you know, clinically impactful application of, of uh, anti-VEGF is in eye disease, in, in, with, with legion to blindness. This, uh, this illustrates you know, the normal rating, you know, and this is actually the fundus of a patient with advanced you know, proliferative diabetic rating. You, know, you can immediately see the, the profound you know, disorganization of these vessels. They are very tortuous. You know, they are very actually they, 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 uh, they, they are very irregular. There is extensive you know, bleeding, which actually can, can be a major cause of blindness. Actually, in many respects, they resemble to tumor vessels for their disorganization. And this vessel actually this tendency to leak. You know. So what are the basis of this leakiness? It's very possible that at some initial stage there is some cytokines, including you know, VEGF, which actually which induce, you know, this uh, open up, you know, junction which induce permeability. But it's very clear now the major reason of this uh, pathological permeability lies in the structure of this vessel. They are very abnormal. They lack, you know, pericyte, you know, actually. The, the loss of pericyte is one hallmark of the diabetic retinopathy. And also they have, you know, this uh, microaneurysm, which actually this uh, outpatching of the vessel wall, which essentially reflect, you know, hyperplasia of endothelial cells, growth of endothelial cells. And actually, the sound areas may have the tendency you know, to burst you know, and bleed. You know. At the time, instead, they can be organized in a thrombus, which result in occlusion of vessels and, and profound ischemia. So very clearly, this is really a really major mechanism of, of increased permeability. And um, um, some 20 years ago, actually, we were very fortunate to measure together with some collaborators, the Jocelyn Diabetes, you know, the level of VEGF in dye fluid of patients with a diabetic retinopathy and other ischemic retinal disease. Actually, the only point that I'd like, I'd like to make it. There was a very striking correlation between the levels of VEGF and, and active disease. Once the disease has become quiescent, VEGF is, uh, is undetectable. And, and we show actually to get, together with some collaborators that the injection of VEGF in the, in the primate eyes essentially largely reproduce all this uh, 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 vascular problem in the, in, in the diabetic retinopathy. There is extensive, you know, there is this tortuosity, you know, there is, a, there is a, uh, the new vessels like, you know, pericyte, you know, they Available microaneurysm, and actually, paradoxically, there is ischemia in the retina for the mechanism I was describing, occlusion of these vessels. And actually, at that time, it's a minimal model of retinal ischemia show, show a very profound inhibition. At that time, it was believed that you know, ischemic retinal disease were not such a good you know, therapeutic target because there is already an effective therapy, which is laser photocoagulation. Instead, um, uh, age-related you know, macular degeneration was thought to be perhaps you know, more of an unmet you know, medical need. This indeed, you know, the leading cause of blindness in the, in the, in the, in the working population. In even a very discrete, you know, lesion, you know, which affects, you know, the macula can essentially destroy the photoreceptor, actually. Historically, AMD has been divided in two types, a dry and wet AMD, even though now it's believed to be more of a continuum, there is actually genetic component. But even though the vascular component is only 20% of the case, it is responsible for 85% of the case of blindness. And 
actually, this uh, cartoon perhaps illustrates in a way, because this vessels actually ingrow in, in the macula across you know, the brook membrane, and essentially they bleed and they leak and they destroy the photoreceptor. And that's the way the vision of an individual with AMD is going to look like, actually. The peripheral vision is largely spare, but the central vision is essentially largely affected. You know, these people actually could be otherwise healthy, but they're unable to read, you know, to write. So it, it, it's a terrible problem. And then many years ago, actually, uh, we, we initiate a clinical program with, the, with an anti-VEGF antibody fra fragment in, in AMD. I must say that this at that time was more of a leap of faith because the animal model, there is no good animal model of AMD. And the, and the, the, the biology was not nearly as strong, you know, at the rational as in the ischemic retinal disease. Actually, there was only immunohistochemical data to support, you know, the presence of VEGF. And so this is the effect of this, this uh, anti-VEGF FAB in, 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 in a very aggressive form of AMD, which you call the classical form, highly vascularized. You know. and the patient followed just by, uh, by, 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 by a chart, by looking at visual acuity in a chart. The green line actually is not a placebo, actually. It was at the time the standard therapy, which is the photodynamic therapy. As you can see, there is an increase you know, in visual acuity and that there is a stop visual loss. Instead, with the two-dose group of ranibizumab, 0.3 and 0.5 milligram, actually in the study where he injected in vitro every month, there was a very surprise this increase in, in visual acuity. And now we know that in 90% of patients, you prevent you know, severe visual loss. And about 35 to 40% of this marked increase in visual acuity, which actually drive you know, this, this curve. And this could be some concept of vascular biology, actually, which summarize what I already said, essentially. Now, we know that, you know, in, unlike, you know, tumors, which seems to be so adept, you know, finding, you know, escape, you know, mechanism, adaptive mechanism, in even in pathological condition, like a macular degeneration, that is much less so. Blocking of VEGF essentially inhibits you know, almost 100% of this angiogenesis, as reflected in the, in the choroidal neovascular membrane. So in response to this unopposed you know, stimulus of VEGF without other maturation factors, these vessels are abnormal. They are very tortuous. You know, they have actually they have, they are very poor in parasite. They develop you know, this microaneurysm, which led you know, to this complication, which impair visual acuity. You know. and, and blocking of VEGF not only inhibits you know, CMV growth, which is cell extremely important. It also actually uh, makes these vessels uh, less abnormal. They, 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 there is an extensive remodeling of these vessels, prune, you know, the pericyte, you know, poor vessels and undergo apoptosis, actually. It's a concept that Dr. Rakesh you know, Jain has referred to as normalization, actually, in applied to tumors. I, I believe it probably applies more to this condition than, than, than to tumors, to the fact, you know, this vasculature is uh, anatomically more normal. And, uh, and now we know that actually the, the, uh, uh, this uh, VEGF inhibitor uh, it had a major impact. And there are, there are three, three VEGF inhibitors which are widely used, you know, ranibizumab, bevacizumab, off-label, and aflibercept. You know. And we know that it had a major impact. Actually, there are some studies which show that if all patients were treated you know, with the VEGF inhibitor, you know, wet AMD would be no longer the, the leading cause of blindness. And, and, and so would be other new vascular disease, including, you know, including uh, retinal vein occlusion and diabetic macular edema. So we can just, uh, this is my last you know, slide actually, with, uh, just you know, to some thoughts about you know, the VEGF inhibitor on, on disease actually. We've seen some benefit in several tumor types to the extent of the VEGF inhibitor, now a standard therapy, multiple malignancy, even uh, not in early stage disease, in advanced malignancy, which actually is be, uh, are incurable. But admittedly, the more dramatic benefit has been seen in this intraocular neovascular syndrome. Perhaps it's obvious because the blood vessels are at this key uh, uh, pathogenic component, the, vas the blood vessels, those which result in destruction of the tissue. Instead, the tumors may have you know, multiple mechanisms which allow them you know, to escape. You know. There is, of course, a lot of challenge. For example, you identify some biomarker in tumors who could be extremely important. And Confident that you know, sooner or later we'll find some, we may be uh, tumor type dependent. And this could, have, uh, could result even in greater impact of this oncological therapy. And now there is a lot of interest in established op uh, combination, optimal combination, for example, combination with other anti angiogenic agent, for example, with the uh, 
with, you know, with the TAI2 uh, inhibitor, so there is a lot of interest in combining you know, a vast in other VEGF inhibitor with a checkpoint inhibitor like NTPDL1. Actually, there are some promising early data. And last but not least, there is a lot of basic science to do to understand you know, the mechanism of resistance. Obviously, this work was not done by one person or, or by a few people, actually. This, the work you know, spanned now almost you know, 30 years, so I want to acknowledge so many colleagues and collaborators, these are some of the most you know, recent you know, postdocs and collaborators. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>